to this section, is someone giving you something that looks like this? And then there's a little confusion. You go, um, when do I make things positive? Right? There's two ways to attack this problem. One way is to say, I'm just going to make everything positive. And the other way is to say, well, let me just add these two numbers up first. Which, is, which one is correct? It's this one. We never apply the absolute value to an expression. We have to wait till it becomes a single number. So you always simplify the inside first. So this one is wrong. You always simplify the inside first before you actually apply the absolute value. Give everyone a chance to catch up. Okay, now let's let's go back to here. So let's. Uh, okay. Now this is the problem you would have learned in the beginning of algebra one. Now in algebra two, we're trying to ask a different problem. We're trying to ask this problem. You tell me what goes inside the absolute value so I get five or so I get a five out of here. Now we know from over here, right? When we look at this, oh, um, X can equal to, five or x can equal to negative five, right? If I plug this in here, I'll get five. And if I plug this in here, I'll get five. So go ahead and copy that. Now, a shorthand way of remembering this is that if you get solved, I'm sorry, um, if you have x is equal to 5, to get rid of the absolute value, you just add a plus or minus. Okay, so the way you get an at, rid of an absolute value if you have an equal here is to add a plus or minus. Okay, so let's work on one of these problems. Let's make it a little bit harder. So if you were to ask a question like the one you have here um, mm -hmm. with the absolute value of x equals 5, mm -hmm. whether we put a positive 5 or a negative 5 in there, it will be correct? No, so you almost said it correct. You have to give me both answers. 
Oh, okay. Okay. So your answer is X. Usually they'll write. Usually they'll have like a comma. So the or is implied. Okay. Meaning that right. So usually they'll say this or that. A sh another way of writing the exact same thing is this. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. All right. So. There's um in the past, whenever we solve the problem, there was one answer. And now what's happening is that, and this will happen more uh more uh more in the future, is that when we answer a problem, there may be more than one answer. So for example, if I said this, And then if I go, which buttons can I press and not die? You go, um, one. So I press four and then I die. And I go, what the heck happened? Like, oh, I meant one and four. Did you want all the numbers that would that would blow up the machine? And you're like, yeah. So whenever you're trying to solve this answer, it's not enough to give me one answer. Okay. I want to know all the answers that caused my rocket ship to explode. Okay. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, let's... Let's do uh, a slightly harder version of this. So let's say we have x plus 3 uh, minus 4 is equal to um, 7. Now, whenever you have an absolute, so what we're going to have in the future are problems that look like this and problems that look like this. Put this in red. Okay. So each one of these will have roughly the same start. Okay. The ending will be a little bit different, but just be aware that what I'm talking teaching you is how to do this with equal. But for all three of these problems, they're going to have the same start. What you want to do is you want to isolate the absolute value. So let me write that, and then let me explain what that means. Okay. What isolate means is I want this to be all by itself. That's my goal. Okay. So I need to get rid of the four. I need the absolute value to be all by itself. Now I'm going to put these rules up here. We're going to leave them up here so they just so we remember them. Okay. Okay. This turns into Give myself room for two more rules. Okay. So if you have an absolute value and you have an equal sign, the way you get rid of the absolute value is you add this plus or minus. Okay. So the way I get rid of this absolute value is I have this plus or minus. Okay. So what we're doing is we're applying the absolute value equal rule. Okay. 
Oh, before I do that, I want to check. Okay. Now, for the first bunch of problems, it's always going to be positive. And at the end, I'll teach you what to do when it's negative. Okay. But for right now, they're all going to be positive. Now, once I do this, I have two problems I have to solve. I have um, x plus 3 is equal to negative 11. And x plus 3 is equal to positive 11. And then you solve those two problems. Minus three, minus three, minus three, minus three. And then those are your two answers. Now, what I'm supposed to tell you now is you have to double check your answer. Well, double checking your answer means you're plugging this answer back into the original equation. So I'm going to put this back into here and see if it worked. So I'm going to get minus 14 plus 3. Now, remember, we don't apply the absolute value until we get a single number. Now, as long as when I double check the left side is equal to the right side, this is a good answer. Sometimes you'll get an answer that doesn't work. Okay. And then go ahead and double check this one. And I'll give you a little like intuition on this stuff. All right. So plug in eight into the original problem. See if you get the right answer. if you can figure this out. So they're both good. Okay. So go ahead and copy that, and let me just tell you something that's going on. Um, it used to be that 
in these books, they used to give you some problems that didn't work just so they would get you in the routine of double checking. Now, the problem with uh, college right now is that there's too many colleges. The number of students that are enrolling into college is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because the number of kids that people are having are, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So what's happening is that we have too many colleges. So then we know that there are going to be some colleges that are closed because there's just not enough people. And we're getting to that tipping point where colleges are trying to get themselves financially secure, but also pass more students because the colleges that are going to close are one, the colleges that can't pay for themselves, and two, the colleges that flunk a lot of people. Okay. So colleges that are now in a competition to pass more people. But it's not like we're not trying. I try. I try my best. So if you go, hey, John, uh, pass more people, um, you should teach better. I'm like, but but I, I'm doing my I have videos. I'm doing my best. I, I haven't been goofing around. And that's true for most teachers. We're, most of us are trying our best. So when you go pass more people, there's only really one, one way to pass more people. That is to make the class easier. So what's going on is that there are a lot of colleges that are making their classes easier because the more people they're passed, the, the less likely that college will close. Now, some of these places are getting ridiculous where in order to make sure we pass a lot of people, we're going to give you a binder and you're not allowed to teach anything outside of the binder. And then we're going to give you your test so we can make sure it's really easy. So even though you get a college degree, it doesn't really buy you anything. Now, right now, Valley College isn't doing that, right? We, if you get accepted to UCLA, you should go. Because if you go to Valley College and UCLA accepts you, normally the transfer students do better than the people who went there as a freshman. And normally the students who go to CSUN do very well. So the graduation rate for Valley College is actually very low compared to other colleges, but part of that is because we're giving you a real education. We have not made that decision to dumb down on classes. Now, the same thing is happening with the textbooks, okay? Normally the textbook we used to use cost $160, okay? And then, um, we've negotiated them down, negotiated them down, negotiated them down. The textbooks now, the, the most popular textbook, My Math Lab, it now costs $60. Uh, that's down from 105 a few years ago. Okay. So they're making a lot less money. Now, XYZ costs only $30 because it's a tiny little company um, with barely any people. And that's why we have mistakes like we did yesterday on, on my problem, but it's 30 bucks, okay? Now the problem with, think of it if you're a textbook writer, you have two textbooks. One textbook has hard questions, one textbook has easy questions. The hard question is gonna flunk more people, the easy questions is gonna pass more people. So what people are doing in order to survive are picking books that are easier. So now the harder books are slowly removing all the hard problems because people go, when you use that book, more people flunk, you're less likely to have a job in 10 years. Use this book, it's easier. Okay. So in the past, this section used to have problems where you would double check it and sometimes it doesn't work. In real life, whenever there's an absolute value, you should always double check it because it may not work. In this book, it will always work. So even though I tell you to double check it, just know it's gonna work, okay? So if you're asking me, well, what kind of questions didn't work? If you watch that video at the end, I, I show you a problem that doesn't work, okay? So even though technically when you get a job from NASA, every time you see an absolute value, double check your work. If it doesn't match, cross out the answer. But just know that for Math 125, you won't ever see one of those problems because the books are trying to are competing to make themselves easier. Okay. Can okay. we do one where it doesn't work? We could do it at, at the end. So I'll, I'll, I can work my way to that. Okay. Professor. Yeah. Go ahead. How would we write our final answer with both numbers? 
Um, it depends. Usually, um, sometimes they'll have two blanks, mm -hmm. and you just plug in both numbers. Usually, it's just something okay. like that, and they'll have a comma in between. We don't put parentheses, though? No. So this is a really good question. Okay. Your answer is negative 14 and 8. Okay. Now, if you wrote it with parentheses, that means your answer is all the numbers, I'm sorry, in between negative right. 14 and 8, right? So and you're giving me an incorrect. interval. So that's one of those real subtle things where don't Ooh. randomly put in parentheses because it mm -hmm. looks cool. So just variable equals number, comma, number. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then because we're using the X, Y, Z, they'll probably have two blanks there. Okay. So let's do the next one. You don't have to double check it because I'm going to tell you all of these work. But just know in real life, you have to double check it. Okay. So let's try this one. Um, Uh, yeah, let's do that. Let's do 10. Okay. Now, I know a lot of people are really, um, a lot of people want to multiply everything by three, okay? This is a box. You cannot multiply anything, um, you cannot um, multiply anything in here by three until you get to this point over here where you get rid of the absolute value, okay? So don't, you can't multiply everything by three right now. Sometimes you'll get the right answer and sometimes you'll get the wrong answer. Sometimes you'll only get one answer, okay? So don't multiply everything by three. Don't get rid of this fraction first. First, get rid of the absolute value. So first, get rid of that negative two, and then turn this into two separate problems, and then get rid of the, the three on the bottom, okay? So let me, let me do what I described, okay? You cannot multiply everything by three here. Until that absolute value is gone, this thing is a box. Now, when you get to this point, now you can multiply each term by three, okay? So you can't do it until you get rid of the absolute value. 
I know some of you will do it anyways and will say, hey, I got the right answer. It works some of the times, not all the times. Okay, so multiply each term by three, multiply each term by three. Multiply this by three, this by three, this by three. Okay, and then these two will cancel. So you end up with. 2x plus 12 is equal to negative 24. 2x plus 12 is equal to 8. Oh, I'm sorry. Positive 24, my bad. Can you work your way down? So let's subtract 12 here, try 12 there. And then we're done. Okay, so we're going to keep working on this. We're not we're not done yet. We're going to keep working on it. Um, let's take a ten minute break. I will give you thirteen. Come back at nine twenty, and then we'll keep going with this. Okay. Take a picture.
Okay. Did um, anyone else have questions on this? On what we have on the board? Okay. So let's look at two pieces here. Um, 
at the end, what's happening is that we have an absolute value equal to a single number. Okay. Now we're going to contrast that with a slightly different problem over here. Well, actually, you know what? Let's do this. Let's see what happens when this is not positive. Okay, let's do that part first. Okay. So let's say I give you a problem like this. Okay. Now, the first thing we want to do is we want to isolate the absolute value. Okay, so go ahead and get rid of that 10. So we're going to subtract 10, subtract 10, and we'll end up with x plus 2 is equal to negative 8. Now, this is the important thing. Notice that over here it's positive. We're not checking to see whether the right side is negative um, in the beginning. We check whether it's negative after you've isolated. Okay, so this is isolated. And you have a negative number. Okay. Now, when you get a negative number over here, see over here it was positive, you have to stop doing this flow. You actually have to just jump out and use logic. Okay? Now, the question is this. This right here, an absolute value, will give you a positive number or zero. Meaning that if I put in, let's say, negative five, I'll get five. If I put in positive five, I'll get five. It's impossible for this to be a negative number. The smallest it can be is zero. Okay. So the question is, can a positive number become a negative number? And the answer is no. So your answer should be uh, no solution. It could be this. It could be do not exist. It could be undefined. They all mean the same thing. It means that there's no answer. A negative number, um, this is a negative number. So if this side has to be positive or zero, it can't be negative. Now, on your test, I like to put one of these on there. So just be aware, you'll probably see one of these. Okay, so after you isolate, if you get something negative, in this case, it's a um, no solution. Okay. Now, the reason why I wanted to show you that is let me give you a, a different problem. So if we have something like this.
So let's look at that problem. Now, I want you to notice that this is negative, which is okay. We only worry about whether this is a negative number if there's this by itself is a negative number. In other books, they'll sometimes give you a problem that looks like this. So even though this is negative here, that's okay because there's an X there. We only check it, check whether it's a negative number or not when um, when there's only a constant on one on this side. There's no variable on the right side. Okay. All right. So let's look at this problem here. Now. The nice thing about this problem is this x plus two, this absolute value is already isolated. So all you have to do now is go that next step. Okay. Now, you're gonna add a plus or minus, but you gotta be really careful this plus or minus applies to everything on the right side. So you need to put a parentheses here. So what will happen is you'll get two problems. And this is really a minus one. You're going to distribute this to both of these. So if you make a mistake, the mistake will be is that you don't distribute that minus one with that eight. And then the other problem will be, okay, then go ahead and solve that problem. I'm sorry, where did the minus one come from? From this right here. You know how we do the plus minus? Okay, okay, okay. Technically, it's plus or minus one times both of these. When it's positive one, it doesn't matter. But when it's negative one, you have to be careful. So there's one answer.
And over here, we'll go uh, minus x minus x. Okay, and then let's just do one more problem. Okay. So if we were to sort of list the kind of problems we have, this is the normal problem. This becomes negative. And then for this one, you remember to do this. So here's one, here's two, here's three, and I also gave you one that had a fraction in it. Okay, and the key here was don't um, multiply by LCD until you remove um, absolute value. Okay. Wait, Professor, did we solve all four of those? Um, we didn't do these exactly, but these types of problems. Oh, okay, they're just types. Yeah. So. The problem with Math 125 is that this is really a hard class to learn math. Usually what we're doing is reminding people of math, right? Because there's just not a lot of just, I've never seen this before, and even though I've never seen it before, I just work harder than everyone else, and I'll spend time in the tutoring lab, and I'll spend a lot of time working on this, more than everyone else. And those people pass during fall and spring. In the summer and the winter, um, it's hard to be that person who just works harder than everyone else just because there's no time. I'm going through three sections a day, okay? Now, normally what I do, what I tell students when they have more time is I tell them, make a flashcard for every type of problem. So when I come to a section, I know that there are five ways you can ask me this question. The normal way, did that become negative? Are there two terms here? Let me remember the plus minus. If I have a fraction, let me remember this trick. So what I tried to, so some of you are gonna go to trigonometry next semester. What you wanna do is you go through the problems the teacher did and say, what are the different ways they can give me uh, this problem? And then you make a flashcard of each one and then write the section down. And on the other side, you solve it. That way, before you study, it's hard to remember after you do homework. Um, when you do homework, you're trying to pick from um, 30 problems. Like there are 30 problems. Which one was this like? There was really not 30 problems. There's really six problems repeated five times. So when you go through the harder math classes and you have more time, this is true for statistics also. Every different little problem, you make a little flashcard. You write down the section, so if you need more examples of it, and that way it helps to it helps your memory in that there's only five ways you can ask me this question. So the last way I can ask you this question is something that looks like this. Oh, 
Uh, let's do, yeah. So let's do that problem. Um, so it says don't multiply by what until you're the, the lowest common denominator. You know, lowest normally common. you want to multiply by three when you see a fracture. Okay. So first isolate it, get rid of the absolute value by turning into two equations, and then you multiply by three. Thank you. Uh -huh. So then this is two. So the nice thing about breaking it down this way, you're going to do like 18 problems, which means you're going to do three of these each, right, or two of these each. And I've just sort of broken down the only ways I can ask you this problem. Okay, so go ahead and do this one. Um, isolate the absolute value. There's no real tricks here. It's just a, it, we're just going to talk about how to get rid of that two. But go ahead and get rid of the four and see if you can get rid of that two. Let's see if you were right or not. So let's isolate it. So then you have two. Okay. Now, the question is, how do I get rid of this two? Okay. Now, what's in between the two and the absolute value is a multiplication, right? And to undo things, something, you always do the opposite operation. So over here, I had a minus. In order to get rid of it, I do a plus. So in order for me to get rid of a multiplication, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a division. Okay. So I'm going to divide this by 2 and divide that by 2. Okay. So that now these two will cancel. And now I'm working on um, x plus 3 is equal to 7. Okay, And then go ahead and work your way down from there.
and then we're done. Okay, so we did every kind of uh, absolute value with equal problem. Okay, now what I'm going to write right now, just watch. You don't have to copy. Okay, let me give everyone a second to copy that, and I'm going to demonstrate something. It's not on the test, but it'll give you some intuition of of, of what this absolute value means. Okay, yeah, you don't have to copy what I'm going to write, but I want to give you some intuition for what we're actually doing. Let's say I have this situation, x is equal to 2. Again, don't copy, not on the test. So when I say um, x is equal to 2, this means that x is equal to plus or minus 2. We spent the whole sort of last hour working on that, which means that this location here and this location here is equal to 2, is equal, right? That equal. Right? If we were to draw our solution, it would be here and there. Now, our next goal is to figure out, well, um, x is uh, less than 2, and x is greater than 2. Now, we're going to color these in a different color. I'm going to color these in red. I'm going to color these points in two. Okay. Now I'm just going to plug in points. All right. Let me try plugging in negative three. And the question is, which one of these statements are true? Is a positive 3 less than 2? No. Is a positive 3 greater than 2? Yeah, right? Because this becomes, this turns into 3 greater than 2. That's true. So this is false. Yes, yep. What are the green lines above the number line represent? It means equal. Oh, okay. Okay. So then at negative 3, this is in this solution set, the greater than solution set. Okay. Now, let's try the same thing with these middle numbers. Oh, sorry, this is greater than. Is one less than two? Yes. It's true here, but it's not true here. One is not bigger than two. That's in the left hand solution set. Now, if we do the other ones, it's also true that zero is less than two and one is less than two. Okay. 
And then if I was going to try uh, three, it's absolute value uh, of three greater than two. Yeah, three is greater than two. Okay, so all I did was plug in these numbers into here and to here, and I just drew a color dot when it was true. Okay, so let's sort of make this a little prettier. So from here to here, well, let me just draw it first. Okay, and then this is negative two and two. The red part solves when x is less than 2. The blue part is the solution to x is greater than 2. So less than, less than means what are all the numbers in between plus and minus 2. Greater than means what are all the numbers outside of plus or minus 2. Equal means, where's the boundary? Okay, so if you're gonna use this as a, as a guide, if I have absolute value of x is equal to two, I get x is equal to plus or minus two. In terms of the red, if I have absolute value of x is less than two, this turns into, X is in between 2 and negative 2. Okay. Now, if I get X is greater than 2, then this turns into X is less than 2 or, I'm sorry, X is less than negative 2 or X is greater than 2. So less than gives me everything on the inside. Greater than gives me everything on the outside. Okay, now we're going to use this as a guide. Professor, this won't be on the test, right? This diagram. No, this is a, a, this part right here is on the test. So let me show you what will be on the test. Okay. So I'm going to give you something that looks like this. Um, okay. Oh, and then we'll make it less than. So you're going to do the same thing you did before. You're going to isolate it, and then you're going to check for a negative number. Okay. So go ahead and isolate absolute value. Okay. So go ahead and get rid of that 5.
Right, so the start of these are all the same. So I'm going to add five, add five. Okay. Now I have to use the, um, I have to check that this is positive. So that's positive. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use less than um, formula. So let's, let's break it down. I have 2x plus 3 is less than 15. Then on this side, I have less than negative 15. So you're saying that everything in the absolute value is in between negative 15 and 15. Professor, mm -hmm. why do you do it like that instead of breaking it up into two formulas? Oh, it's just easier. Okay. I know some people do and, and then you have to do an and at the end. I like keeping it, I like doing it this way only because I know that um, this way is a little bit easier. I don't okay. have to do the and logic. And that will apply to any inequality absolute value. Problem. Any less than, yes. Okay. okay. Only, oh. wait, only in less than? Only less than. Because when we do the greater than, we use an or. Right, okay. 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 So we're saying that the inside of this is in between 15 and negative 15, just like we did that over here. The inside of the absolute value is in between positive and negative of that same number. Okay. Now, some of you are going, oh my God, I don't, I don't know what this is. Okay. Normally we have two sides, right? And if I say solve this problem, what would you do? You go, well, I would multiply each side by, uh, I, I would subtract three from both sides. And you go, great. Subtract three, subtract three. Now I have three sides. I have less than, middle, bigger than. So what you're gonna do in this case is you're gonna do it to all three sides. So now you get negative 18 is less than 2x is less than 12. And then again, you sort of look at this and go, well, if you had this case, I think I made you guys do this yesterday. And I'd say, hey, how would you get rid of that too? you like, oh, I divide the 2x and the 12 by two. Then great, you have three sides now. Do it to all three sides. So then my answer is so the nice thing about this is that because I'm not using the and. I'm just doing the same calculation to, to both of these numbers. And then that way I don't have to like do some kind of logic move afterwards. Let's go copy that and then we'll do another one. Okay, so let's, I'm going to just erase this very top part. I want to give you one that has a fraction.
Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. This should be a lesson. So go ahead, isolate it. Okay. Get rid of that 10. And then do this part over here. So let's take a look at this. Um, okay. I'm going to add 10. Okay, so I have um, 2 thirds x plus 4 is less than 12. Now remember, I don't want to multiply this by three until I get rid of the absolute value. Okay. So let's get rid of this absolute value and we're going to get two thirds X plus four is in between 12 and in between negative 12. Now, a um, couple of things you can do. You can, you can get rid of the four first, or you can multiply by three. It doesn't matter which one you do. Um, I guess I will multiply by three first. So if I had something like this, you go like, okay, how do you get rid of that fraction? Multiply every term by three. But now we have this extra one. Multiply that one by three also. So we're going to multiply this by three, this by three this by three, and this by three. And then we're gonna cross these out. So now I have negative 36 is less than two X plus 12 is less than 36. 
So go ahead and do that. Subtract the 12, divide everything by 2, and then you got your answer. I'd subtract 12, subtract 12, subtract 12. And then I would divide everything by 2. Now, whether this is less than or less than or equal, you would do the exact same thing all the way down. How would we set up a greater than equation? Yeah, okay. So then we'll do that one next. Okay. okay. Let's take a picture of this one. Now, I'm just going to move the top up here. Um, greater than or equal to 12. Okay, so now you're going to use this formula. Okay, so first isolate it. Okay, so let's subtract five. Subtract five. Now this will turn into it's going to be equal to seven. So now we're going to use the um, greater than or equal to formula.
Now, so let's just look at how to do this one. Okay. So one of these looks exactly the same. You just remove the absolute value. On the left side, you change this to a less than or equal, and then you make this into a minus seven. So this is everything smaller than negative seven, everything bigger than seven. Okay, and then go ahead and write that in interval notation. Okay. Now, this will then go minus 3, minus 3, minus 3, minus 3, and now I get x is less than equal to minus 10, or x is greater than equal to 4, so now you have negative infinity to negative 10, and then we need a bracket, union 4, comma, infinity. Now, it's important that you put the negative one on the left because you want to go from small to big. Uh, one of the mistakes people do is they put this one first and then this, and then it's wrong because you have to go small to big. Okay, so let's, let's see if I can give you three problems that are almost exactly the same. Let's see if you can do the small difference. So first do this one. Um, let's make this one greater than, since that's the one we just did. Wait, is that right? No, that's not right. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, let's do that. Okay, and then I'll give you a less than problem and an equal problem. Oh, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. 
Now subtract three, subtract three. Now, we're going to look at everything smaller than negative 7. So minus 1. So this one looks exactly like this. This one is it flips and then becomes a negative. And then we're going to add one. Now let's, let's do a less than and equal problem. Um, professor, mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time figuring out like when, when we flip it and then and make it into um, two equations as opposed to just like one. Yeah, we did. I'm glad you asked me. When this is greater than, that's when it's two pieces. Okay, when it's greater than. Okay. Okay, right. So you're you're asking exactly the right question at exactly the right moment. The thing you got to pay attention to is this right here. That's what tells you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this will be a minus three, minus three. Now, because this is a less than, we're going to go um, minus 7 okay. Now the reason why there's only one here and there's two over here is because this one is a less than, and this one is a greater than. Professor? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So when we write out the full equation negative 7, the symbol 2x minus 1, the symbol never changes? Yeah. Um, yeah. This is always going to be less than, yes. Oh, and then this should be equal also. I'm sorry. My bad. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, Thank better? You. Yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah. Let me add one here. And we get um, minus 6 less than or equal to qx. And then we're going to divide everything by 2. So do you notice that these numbers are the same? This is everything outside of negative 3 and 4, and this is everything in between negative 3 and 4. And if you do that one correct, you should just get x is equal to negative 3 and 4. Wait, can you explain that again, please? Yeah. So we sort of talked about what this answer is. I'm sorry. is that everything on the outside of negative 3 and 4. What this one is here is everything in between negative 3 and 4. If we think of this like a, as, as a number line. Oh, OK. And then when we do this one, this will give us our boundary, negative 3 and 4 and nothing else. Right. OK, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, professor? Uh-huh. Um, so in this case, can we just solve the problem with e, uh, equal and then just, and then when we get the result, we just turn into, in, you know, lesser than or greater? Okay. All right. I'm going to tell you what I'm supposed to tell you, and I'm going to tell you the real deal. What I'm supposed to tell you is, no, this is math. This is supposed to equal to this, is supposed to equal to this, is equal to equal to this. Now, what the real deal is, yeah, it, it works. <laughs> if you just do plus minus, get these two number, and know that less than is in between and greater than is outside, absolutely it works. And I have a lot of students who go like, I don't want to memorize all these rules. I just want to change it at the end. Is that okay? And I'll say, yeah, I'm not, yeah. You're just turning into X, Y, Z. I can't see your work. So, yeah, it's okay. Thank you. It, it works. Okay. Professor. Yeah. So a greater than scenario will always evolve and like go in separate ways. And then a less than will always involve coming together. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And then equal is just two dots on a number line. Perfect. You said per okay. perfectly. Yeah. Okay. So let's go minus three, minus three. Uh, seven. Because normally people like this one. I like the plus minus one. So now you go 2x minus 1 is equal to uh, negative 7. And 2x minus 1 is equal to 7. So we get 2x is equal to negative 6. x is equal to negative 3. 2x is equal to 8. x is equal to 4. And then that's our answer. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give everyone a 10-minute break. Let's come back at 10.30. We're almost done with this section. There's a couple of things I want to cover. There's the uh, what happens if I have a negative and a less than scenario. And then there's also the why would – what's this used for? Like this seems really confusing. I, I have no idea why anyone would want to use an absolute value like this. And we'll talk about this. This used to be on the nursing um, exam. It's not anymore, but it used to be. And I'll explain why it is, okay? Or why it used to be. So let's come back at ten thirty, and we'll 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 get back to this.
Okay, so let's get going. Um, does anyone have a question what's on the board? Because I'm going to erase it. Okay, no? Anyone? Okay. All right, so I'm going to erase this, and then 
We have one more thing to do, and then just sort of explaining how this is actually used in real life. So, oops. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's get going. Oops, 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 oops. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, now, let's say we get to the isolated water. Okay. Now, so when we do all these problems, we isolate, and then we check if this is negative or not. And then, oh my God, we got a negative number. Now, I usually put one of these problems on your um, quiz, just to make sure that you remember to check for a negative number. Okay. Now, the idea behind this is that um, when you have something like this, this is a, um, an absolute value can only give you a positive number or a zero. See, if I plug in a negative number here, I get a positive number back. If I plug in a positive number, I get a positive number back. And the smallest this can possibly be is zero. So ask yourself, can a positive number be less than a negative number? Can a positive number be less than a negative number? Negative number? And the answer is no. No, positive numbers are bigger than negative numbers. So the answer to this is no. So your answer is no solution or undefined or does not exist. Let me see if I can see what it's written as in your uh, in your uh, um, X Y Z. X, Y, Z would probably be um, does not exist. Does not exist? Okay. So it's probably does not exist. I'll just believe you guys. Okay. But it'll be one of those. Okay. So let's look at this one over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's make this one equal. Okay. So this is a... Um, positive number or zero. Can a positive number or zero, can a positive number be equal to negative five? And the answer is no. So that is also does not exist. or no solution, or undefined. Any of those are fine. Okay. So go ahead and copy that. And this last one is, one you, is the one you have to be careful about. Now, the idea here is this is a positive number of zero. Okay. 
can a positive number be greater than a negative number? And the answer is, yeah. In fact, every positive number is greater than a negative number. So it'd be yes. All of them are. So then you would write negative infinity, infinity right? Because all the positive numbers are greater than a negative number. Any number you put in here will give me a positive number. And all of them are greater than a negative number, so any number works. Okay, so go ahead and copy that, and then we'll talk about where this is used. So a greater than will always be infinite? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Negative infinity to infinity, meaning that any number you put in here will work. Right. It will be bigger than a negative five. Let me give everyone a second to copy that. Okay. Now, this used to be um, on the nursing test because it was very important. And, the, and, the, and then most people go, uh, I've, I've never seen this. How could this possibly be important? Okay. Now, um, let's just talk about, um, let's talk about how new information happens. Okay. I'm going to erase this. If you read something in a textbook, in order for it to reach a textbook, what happens is people will argue over it, argue over some concept like absolute value. And at some point you come to a consensus and they go, okay, we all agree. Now, after you all agree, someone has to convince the colleges that this is something worth learning. So let's say something new like, uh, global warming and green technology. We've known about global warming for 30 years and we're only starting to have curriculum that reflects global warming in the curriculum. Even though it's a thing that's existed, science has worked on it, it's taken a long time for science to come to a consensus on global warming. And then it hits the, now once you put it in the curriculum, someone's got to go and write the book and then publish the book. So if you go, at best, when you read something out of a textbook, it takes 10 years. It takes 10 years um, for something to get into a textbook, only because that's just the process. Okay. Now, the thing that's more important is a journal paper. So let's say I discover a vaccine for COVID. And uh, what I will do is I will first publish it unofficially. So there are websites that say, this is my idea. Put a timestamp on it. No one has looked at it. No one knows if it's real or not. A lot of times it's BS. But there are um, websites where you go, here's my paper. I have a timestamp. If anyone else comes up with it, just so you know, I'm first. Now, those websites have are only giving you a time step of when you discovered it. No one has really looked at it to say, yeah, that's true. 
Now, after you get a timestamp for it, right, to say I'm first, you then send it to a journal. And then what will happen is the people in the journal will take it, they'll read it, they'll argue about it. And if they think that this is important and they think it's true, what they'll then do is accept it. Now, what happens after they accept it is that you have one year to rewrite it. And usually you'll write like a 10 page paper and they'll come up to you and go, um, we'd like to have more papers in our journal than less. So you can't have 10 pages to write your paper. You can have only six. So every time you write a paper, you defend it using all this detail. And then they go, we're gonna rob you of space and you need to write your idea in as little space as possible. Okay, That's where this stuff comes into play. Okay, now let's look at some just basic polling data. Okay, so I just pulled one up. I just wrote down Biden Trump poll, All right? And I'm gonna share a screen with you. Okay, so here is a typical, here's typical data. Now, if you are in business, it may be on unemployment. If you are in sociology, it may be on uh, police violence statistics, but you always get this data here, right? 49%, 40%, and then uh, you get this error rate, okay? So it says Joe Biden has 49% support plus or minus 3.5%. Now let's come back here. So how much how much um how many people want to vote for Joe Biden? It's not really exact. It's really X is in between 49% plus 3.5 and X is in between 49% uh, minus 3.5. So you're really looking at a range from 40, uh, five to, and then notice this on the test. You don't have to write any of this down. Now, if I went on to the newscast and I went, Biden is um, Biden support is 45.5% to 52.5%, uh, you'd go, what? Which is why we say we pick the middle number. The very middle number is 49%, plus or minus a little bit of air. Okay. Now, another way to write this to write this is to write it as Professor. Uh-huh. Isn't the 45.5, so isn't the 49% the average of the two intervals? It's in the middle, yeah. Okay. Okay, meaning that we didn't ask everyone in the country. We asked only about 3,000 people. So we could be wrong. And you're like, well, how, how wrong are you? Eh, around that much. We could be wrong eh, around that much because when we poll people, there's 325 million people in this country which means that there are at least 200 million voters and I can't ask every voter, that's too expensive. I'm only asking 3,000, so I'm saying ish, it's around here ish. Okay, now, if you wanna say who wants to vote for Biden, like who is in this range? You would say um, X minus 49 less than 3.5. This is the middle. This is the air. So this tells me everything that's in this range. Sorry, middle.
that tells me everything outside of that range. Right? So the nice thing about this, like let's say, let's say nerf. Okay. Um, if the doctor says, hey, um, if the if the patient's um, temperature goes from 99 to 100, I'm sorry. If it's between 98 and 100, don't call me. But if it goes outside of that range, I need you to call me. So he could write it like this. When it's 99, plus or minus one, in that interval, oh, I'm sorry, that's a don't call me. Don't call me. But if it's outside of that range, if it's too big or too small, you need to call me, right? So this is a very, um, this is a very uh, succinct way where you don't have to use a lot of words to explain it. Um, this concept of here's the middle plus or minus uh, plus or minus this error. This tells me I'm within the good range. This tells me I'm outside of the good range. This tells me you better watch carefully. Does the one stand for 100? Uh, no, no, one percent. So think 1%. of this as nine, not 99 degrees plus or minus one degree. Okay. Okay, so that's the error. So 99 is fine for me. Up to one degree more, less than one degree more, um, I'm okay. But you go past that, I need to get a phone call. So this is just a nice way of saying in the interval, outside the interval, on the boundary. And you can know what he's trying to infer by just looking at the sign. So when you're writing a journal paper and they're shrinking your information, you'll have something like this and you'll you'll write a big long thing about it. And then at a certain point, you're like, I gotta cut that whole paragraph. For these people, they like Biden. For these people, they don't like Biden. You can just use these signs to say in the group, out of the group. And it allows you to, to cut down pages out of your journal papers. So that's where this thing is used is to write a, a very succinct way of this concept here. Okay, and then that last part, none of it's on the test. Okay, so let's go to 3.1. I don't think we're, well, we're definitely not gonna finish it, but we're gonna start it, okay? So 3.1 is graphing. Oh, and before we go there, let's, um, Before we go, then, let me uh, show you some support I have for you. Okay, so let's go to my math lab. Oops, I'm sorry. So part of the problem right now with all the COVID information that's coming out, in order for something to be put in a journal paper, it takes, if you're lucky, a year and a half. Normally, it takes two to three years. So when we've been seeing all of these, um, all of these uh, uh, things about these um, COVID medicines, um, let's see, treatment, I mean, it's hydroxy, let's see. So if we look at this uh, hydroxychloroquine, okay? In Britain, they started using it and it seemed like it worked. And then what happened was the VA over here said, great, we're gonna give it to about three, 4,000 people. We're gonna see what happens. And then they did it and it looked like it didn't work. It looked like people were getting, it was, it was worse because people were getting heart problems. 
Okay. And then um, the president went and said, I'm just taking it anyways. Now, a very respected um, medical journal came out and said, we looked at five different um, studies. And the data from the five different studies show that it did not work. Okay. And then a week later, um, they came out with a retraction that said, we had we sent this our paper to some of peer some people to do peer review, and they have some criticisms of how the data was collected. So we retract our paper and we say that it is that our paper was incorrect. And then since then, there's been another, um, some other people who said, okay, we've looked at the data, we feel confident about it, it doesn't work. So now officially the FDA says it doesn't work. Now the reason why you had this ping pong effect is because you didn't have the three years it normally takes for us to do a study. So what's happening is doctors are looking at stuff, it seems like it worked, I'm gonna say it so other doctors can hurry up and use it because we don't know. So normally when you do a drug study like that, there's three trials. The first one you're doing on animals, the second one you're doing on just a handful of people, and then the third one you're doing on a lot of people. And that thing can take like six, seven years. So the reason why you're seeing this ping pong back and forth about the uh, hydroxychloroquine is mostly because it hasn't had the normal scrutiny time that journal papers have. You, normally you have three years to look at it and you and people who read it have months to look at it, think about it, ask the author a question. And the reason we just, we just aren't doing that right now because we're, we're trying to get out as much good information as possible, which is why you see this ping pong. Now, if you ever get a PhD and actually work with new stuff in your field, this is what it feels like. It is a bunch of people arguing to the point where at some point, okay, we have all argued ourselves and most of us now decide, um, agree on one thing. Okay. Now let's go to the haiku. So we go to math 125. Okay. So there's a couple things here. Um, I have a compound inequality worksheet and I have an absolute value worksheet. Just because I know these are typically the two problems that people get wrong on the final. Let me get the absolute value and put it up here. So it'll be on the top um, right. Okay. So the video is there that goes through this entire lecture. So in a month, you're probably not going to remember this, but there's a video there. There's also a worksheet. And um, the work, and then there's also a um, solution. So none of this is stuff that you have to do. But if you say, I want to do like 15 of these and get into a rhythm, they're all right there. And then um, most likely you're going to forget it for the midterm just because we're going to drop a lot of other information here. The videos are right here for you also. Okay, so it's meant to be a, a, a video uh, worksheet solutions, and then you just do it until you until you feel comfort with the patterns. Okay. Now let's go to section three point one, and what section three point one is is graphing. Okay. Now, my goal is that if you cannot graph, then I'm going to try really hard to flunk you. And if you can't factor, I'm going to try really hard to flunk you. Not because I'm trying to be a jerk, but for most things, like a lot of topics that we cover, in the next class, they'll review a little bit because they'll go, you probably didn't remember absolute value. Here's a quick problem with the absolute value. Now let's go forward. Now in the next class, however, they're not going to review graphing and they're not going to review factoring just because it takes too long. So. 
you need to walk into Math 259. You need to walk into my business calculus class. You need to walk into trigonometry knowing how to graph. Okay, so this is one of the it sections, not because it's hard, but because it's one of the sections where teachers usually don't review much. Okay, so section 3.1, graphing. Okay, then let me get my notes on that. Okay, now, what happened was, um, Around 1800s, Isaac Newton came up with the concept of gravity. Now, he didn't know what it was. In fact, we still don't know what gravity is. We don't know. How, we just know that it exists. We don't know how to measure it. We don't know if it's a particle or if it's a wave or if it's a subatomic thing. We don't know how the hell gravity works. Okay. But Newton came up with gravity. Even he was explain, able to explain the movements of the planets. And when we shoot a missile, he could tell you where it landed and when it landed. Now, what happened was this affected Christians in the same way that evolution affects Christians. People went, if uh, we evolved from monkeys, then how do you have a seven-day creation? So in the same way, if you said, hey, this thing drops, not because God wanted to drop, not because God took this and dropped it, um, it's because... Um, this gravity thing, and we can actually predict stuff dropping and how fast it'll drop and how hard it'll drop and where it'll drop. People felt like you're, you're kicking God out of the world. Because when I looked at trees and leaves fall, I saw God. And now you're telling me, no, no, it's a clock. Things move because there are laws that make it move in exactly the same way. It's not God picking it. Now, Newton wasn't trying to do this. Newton was a devoutly, devoutly religious man. So uh, Newton used the concept of gravity to say, look how great God is. He created these rules and the trees fall, and the leaves fall. Okay? But a lot of people at the time really struggled with it. So now came this guy, this guy named Descartes. What Descartes set out to do was to prove God. Right? We just used science, and now people are questioning God. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use science like proofs and theorems, and I'm going to prove the existence of God. So the very first line of his proof was, um, I think, therefore I am. Meaning that how do I prove there's a God? Well, first, I got to prove that I'm not high. I got to prove I'm not drunk. I'm not, I got to prove I'm not hallucinating. I got to prove that I'm not in a dream, that this is reality. And since I'm thinking, I guess we're in reality. So that was his first line of his proof. Now think about it, right? He's trying to use math to prove God. So somehow he's got to take something physical and change it into numbers and X's and Y's so that we can process it just, just like we just did over here. Now, Descartes never, like people look at his proof of God and they go like, ah, I think I don't think that really works. But in the process of proving God, he was able to take objects that we see and, and transform them into a mathematical, mathematical object. Okay. The other thing Descartes did was he proved rainbows. He proved how rainbows exist. So Descartes was just going around just trying to say, I got to find a way to prove God. Okay. So how do I get my outside world into my inside world? So let's look at this. X plus Y is equal to 5. So let's think about it. What are all the numbers where I add them together and I get 5? Well, there's uh, 1 and 4, right? 1 plus 4 is 5. And 4 plus 1 is 5. And 2 plus 3. And 0 plus 5. And what if I use uh, negative numbers? Negative one and six. How about, I, how about if I use fractions? A half and four and a half. Right? All of these pairs, when I add them up, I get five. So then the next thing he did was he goes, well, how can I see my solutions? 
right? Of all the numbers, when I add them together, I get five. He goes, well, let's look at it this way. He said, let me create two number lines. I'm going to call the first number line X. I'm going to call the second number line Y. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat these like they're points. So on my first number, right, my first number, this is my X's. I'm going to go one, and then I'm going to go up to four. Okay. So this is one, four. Okay, so one on the is on the x axis, four on the y axis. And then over here, I'm going to do four. I'm going to put a point here. So Four on the x-axis, the four is the first number. Okay. One on the y-axis. Now go ahead and see if you can graph these points. Right? Two on the x, and then three on the y. Okay. Two and then three. And then zero on the x axis. I'm oh, sorry, zero on the x axis. Then five on the y. Okay. And then you could do half. Half is in between zero and one, so a half is here. And four and a half is between four and five, so you're looking at something like right there. Try another one, try, um, try uh, five comma zero and try. Uh, six comma negative one. Oh, negative one six is this over here. So try this one. Try that one. And then just know that I have a a, a video that goes through everything we're going to go through right now. Okay, on 3.1. So do these last two. Okay. So five on the X, then zero on the Y, and then six on the X. Okay, and then what do we discover? Every solution, right? Every two numbers that add up to five is on this line. Right? So any point that any two points that I add together and turn into five will be on this line. And he found this pattern, and he called it a linear equation. So this right here is a linear equation. 
Linear means line. So sometimes I'll call it a line equation. Equation means that I have an equal sign, something equal to something. And that he discovered that this thing right here, something that has this four, if I met, if I draw a dot on every number that satisfies that equation, I'll get a line. Okay. Now, this is a pretty remarkable discovery. Because of Descartes, we can actually look at something. We can look at a table and then we can put it into a CAD and then to design it or to fix it or to mess with it. Why? Because he was able to say, how can I take something, how can I take geometry and turn it into algebra? Okay, now let me take a picture of this. Okay. Now, let's do some bookkeeping. He called the middle of his uh, coordinate system, he called this the origin. This entire system is called the rectangular coordinate system. Or sometimes they call it Cartesian after Descartes. Now, some people will ask me, um, are there other ways to like, uh, are there other ways in which I can sort of like uh, show a point on the, on the board? And the answer is, yeah, this is not on the test, but we have what's called a, uh, when a guy uh, tells, a guy um, tells another guy, you're at a bar, you go, check it out, man, two o'clock, two o'clock, 10 feet. There's a pretty girl. That's a different, that's a, a rotational coordinate system, meaning that at two o'clock, there's a pretty girl over here. So the other way of sort of describing location, one way is to say, go three inches this way, and then, I'm sorry, four inches this way, and then one inch this way. Another way is to say, oh, there's a pretty girl at about 2.30. She's about five feet away from us. But those are the two main ones. Okay, now let's do some more bookkeeping. Points that are in this area are called are in the first quadrant. Points that are in this area are called the second quadrant. Over here, this is the third quadrant. And then this is the fourth quadrant. So this point right here is uh, six comma negative one. So sometimes what will happen is, I think in your homework, they'll ask you, um, what quadrant? is in and then you'll just draw the you'll draw the point and you go oh that's in q4 so they'll just use q as shorthand for quadrant So they have a bunch of points, a bunch of questions where they'll say, put a dot where this point is, and then they'll ask you what quadrant it is. And then they'll also ask you if it's on the X or Y axis. So this point is on the X axis. This point is on the Y axis. Okay. It's just when it's on one of these lines here. Okay, so let's take a picture of this and then let's, let's keep going. Okay, now. Let me erase this right here. 
So this part's on your homework, but not on your test. I won't ask that. Okay. Now I'm gonna erase this. All right. If you need me to stop, yell. Okay. Now, what um, Descartes figured out that anything that has this form is a line. Now, know that A, B, and C are real numbers. So as long as I replace A, B, and C with a random number, I know that I can, well, when I graph this, it'll, it'll turn into a line, okay? So if I just pick, I don't know, my favorite negative number, just randomly, A, B, and C. As long as I don't have a square here or a square root and I'm not multiplying, I have something X plus something Y is equal to something, I know that that's a line. Now, they don't have to be in this order. I can also leave it like this. These are, so these are lines. So they don't have to be in X, y, um, um, X, Y, and then C, um, C order. As long as I can move things around so it turns into this, it's a line. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay. So things that are not line. are things that look like this. When you multiply the x and y, or if you have a square, or if the x is the denominator, those things are not lines. The x's and the y's have to be um, um, have to be um, uh, no squares and in the numerator. Can okay, we give it a second to digest that? Now, the tricky ones are things like this. These are all lines also. Now, you might go, hey, um, how can that be a line? Uh, where the heck is the Y? Well, we said A, B, and C can be any real number. That number could be zero. And if I simplified that, I'd get something like that. Okay. 
over here you may tell me, hey, where the hell, where, where the heck is the X? And over here you may ask me, where's my C? So the left side is examples of lines. The right side are things that are not lines. Okay, now, let me give everyone a second to copy that and then we'll work on it. Now, for those of you who are nervous about learning about graphing, please, please, please watch the 3.1 video before you come to class tomorrow, okay? That 3.1 video will walk through everything we're gonna do. We're gonna go pretty fast tomorrow. So if this, you know whether you've conquered this or not. If you did not conquer it, please watch the 3.1 graphic video. It is the very first video I made because it was the most important topic that people struggle with. Okay, now, so let's actually try to grab something. Now we're gonna we're gonna go one step at a time. Now, in order to draw a line, you usually need two points, right? Two points, I can draw a line. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do three points. That way, if you make a mistake, you'll get a triangle and you know you made a mistake. Okay. Okay, now. I'm going to tell you in this problem what what numbers to use, but then when you, uh, you're doing your homework, you're going to uh, pick the numbers of what to use. Okay. Now, normally in this section, uh, what the book usually says is, ah, pick a bunch of different numbers, and if you get a fraction, pick a different number until you don't get a fraction. Okay. Now, I'm not a big fan of that, but I'm going to uh, show you why. Okay. So let me just kind of randomly pick some uh, pick some numbers. So I'm going to pick uh, one here. I'm going to pick uh, one here, and then I'm going to pick two here. Okay. Now you don't have to know what this means. I'm going to show you what this means in a second. What this means is we're going to set up three problems. So I'm going to call it red, green, and blue. What this means here is plug in x equal 1 into here. So this is what the red one means. Solve that problem, right? Because the one is in the x column. What the green is saying the y is equal to one. Solve that problem. And what the blue is saying is. Why is it 
Now the question that people are going to ask is, why did you pick one one two? And the answer is, I just randomly pick numbers. So normally sections they go, well, pick small numbers. Hopefully you don't get a fraction. If you get a fraction, pick a different number. What I'm going to do, the reason why I want you to to pick um, to watch three point one is that I think that's a poor process. So in 3.1, I give you advice on how to pick these numbers so you never get a fraction. Okay, that's why I want you to watch that video. But we're gonna go over it tomorrow. But let's solve each one of these, right? I'm gonna plug one into here. And I subtract two from both sides. Now go ahead and do the other two. Okay. Plug in one into here, solve for x. Plug in two into here, solve for x. Okay. So plug in one into there. Now go ahead and do this last one. Usually when you're graphing, it's easier to use mixed numbers. Okay. Now, each one of these are points. So what I want you to do now is I want you to graph those three points. Now, when you're doing the X, Y, Z, they're only going to ask you for two points because you really only need two points. That third point is to make sure you didn't make an error. So just make sure you plug in the two points and then plug in one more so it's aligned. Now I don't even think, I don't think XYZ even accepts fractions. So if you were to get this situation, they would say, hey, guess a number, another number. And you're like, well, what number should I guess? Three, zero, nine, eight? I don't know. Keep guessing until you don't get a fraction. Um, tomorrow we'll work on uh, good ways of guessing numbers to plug into here. Okay, so go ahead and, and plot those three points. They should be in a line.
Now, we're not going to do a ton of graphing. So you don't have to go and buy a packet of graph paper. I know some people will automatically do that. If you go onto Google and you type graph paper, you can just print out graph paper. So you don't have to buy a whole packet. You could just print out like 10 pages and then be done with it. One and five, three and one, and two and a half, so two and a half and two. You could kind of see like, oh yeah, this lines up. This over a little bit. Okay. Now, um, let's take a picture of this. Okay. So there's a couple things that are gonna that you guys need to do. So for XYZ homework, do uh, section 2.9, 2.10. Watch 3.1 video. And if you skip both of these homework but watch the video, I would be happy. I'd be fine with that. I think this is the most important thing for tonight. Make sure you watch that video to know that um, what we're doing, because you can pass this class and screw up these questions. You cannot pass this class and screw up this question, okay? So the 3.1 is crazy important because it's gonna be something you're gonna be doing over and over in your next classes. So now's the time you've got to ask questions and drill on it, okay? Now, the other thing too is I'm gonna email you two worksheets. Over this week and next week, we're going to slowly work on, work on the worksheets uh, in class. The problem with working on graphing is that when uh, if I draw something on the board, it's really hard for you to copy it. So I'm going to email you two worksheets, and what will happen is we'll just walk through it together. And that way you don't have to draw what I'm drawing. You can just uh, write on the worksheets. Now. I would recommend printing the worksheets. Some of you um, are using an iPad and writing on your notes on top of an iPad, so that's fine. But when we get to these, uh, uh, when we get to these problems, you're probably going to want to write notes on the graph. So I'm going to email it to you. You got to have some way to sort of write notes on it. So um, we'll start working on those worksheets from tomorrow. So see if you can print both of them, okay? Because it'll just make note taking a lot easier in the next next few days. Okay. Anyone have questions? I, so we're done. So at eleven thirty, I hit it on the nose. So um, we have not. We are going to spend an hour and a half on three point one. So if you're lost, watch the video. And we're going to spend an hour and a half together on it. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, professor? Sure. Um, 
there was a problem in the high XYZ homework uh -huh. in section 2.8. Okay. Number 17 question. Uh, when I saw the answer to the question was true statement with no variable. Okay. I you want to give me know, the problem? I want to know how oh. can I enter the answer in the high, uh, XYZ homework. Oh, I see. Okay. Which problem it was it? 2.8, which section? Um, section 2.8 and question number 17. Okay. So let's take a look at it. Um, all right. So let's take a look. XYZ. We're going to log in. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not you. That's not me. That's someone else. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, huh. there you go. There we go. And then it is this one, 2.8. And we said uh, 17? Yes. Okay, let's take a look. Um, so it should let's look like this. And then you want to be able to write. Um, the answer in the XYZ, uh -huh. I can't find. Because oh, okay. uh, no solution. Uh, to respect oh, okay. So when I click in here, when I click in the box, you'll see this little yellow arrow. Yes. So let's click on that, and then just it does not exist. But uh, answer is don't. Uh, it's not correct. Yeah. So that's what D and E means. Does not exist. I did it um, uh, so many times, but uh -huh. answer is not submitted. It's not working. Oh, okay, let's see. Um, oh, oh, oh. No, so this one is supposed to be negative infinity to infinity. Give. Can you read me your, your question? Go ahead, read it to me. We'll do it together on the board. One over four x minus one over five x like that? Greater than or equal to 1 over 20x minus 1 over 5. Something like this? Yes. So I have two x's on both of these sides? Okay. So the first thing we want to do is Let's get rid of all of our uh, def all of our fractions. Okay, so I'm going to multiply everything by twenty. So let's simplify this. And then um, this will turn into five. This will turn into four. Um, that will just cross out. And then this will turn into four. So now I have um, 5x minus 4x is greater than or equal to x minus Four. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, there we go. So then when I combine my terms here, and then let's subtract x. Okay. 
Now, is this a true statement or a false statement? It's uh, true. True, okay. So that means that any number will work. So your answer should be this. Thank you, thank you. Okay, is that better? Yes. Okay, thank you. And what if it's false, Professor? If it's false, then you do the does not exist. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I not? Did I, did I just not show it to you the entire time? I apologize. Okay, is that better? 